Good, good afternoon and welcome to another wonderful Lexio. I'm glad to see everybody. When I approached the text for today's Lexio, I asked myself the question, why this text here? And I asked it on two levels. Why this place in Mark's gospel? And then why now in the lectionary year? So those are the two things that we'll think about together. Um, the first question is the easier, why this text here? Um, an important key to a gospel text is where the evangelist places it in his narrative. Where does the text appear in the overall structure of the gospel and why? And that's why we call the gospel writers redactors because they move bits of the text around. Um, so let me give you some examples in Mark. In, in Mark uh, 1, 16 to 39, at the outset of the gospel, Mark presents a typical day in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus calls disciples, he teaches, he heals, and he prays. And in the rest of Mark's gospel, Jesus is doing one or the other of these things. You can just watch for it. Or, for example, most of chapter 4 is a collection of parables. He has put together a particular genre of material. And now in 435 to 543, we get another genre collection. It's a collection of miracle stories. Jesus stills a storm. And we heard that text wonderfully um, uh, opened up for us by Dr. Waters last week. Jesus stills a storm and he casts out a demon. He heals a woman with a gynecological problem and he raises uh, a little girl from the dead. And thus he demonstrates his authority over nature and the spirit world and the human body and death itself. So that the unit of material in 521 to 43 uh, narrates Jesus' capstone miracles, his authority over everything, nature and the spirit world and the human body. And so the text that we now have before us um, narrates the capstone two miracles, the healing of, uh, of the human body and the raising of the little girl from the dead. And we're supposed to come out of that unit of material with the idea that Jesus is Lord of everything. And that brings us then to the second question. Why this text at this point in our liturgical year? Well, I think as I, as I sort of pondered that, that it might be because we have in this text three sayings of Jesus, one to each of the major characters that set out in miniature the whole message of Jesus. First, do not fear. Second, the child is not dead but sleeping. And third, little girl, arise. Jesus is going to reiterate these three lessons in various ways in all of the texts we have between now and, uh, now and Advent. So this is sort of the appetizer for the feast of texts that will follow for us between now and Advent. Now, before I talk about those three, I, I want to have two very brief excurses on the literary structure and the suffering woman. Um, I'm going to focus on the framing of this intercalation. An intercalation is a compositional device that Matthew or that Mark uses. It's one of his favorites. And so here's how you remember what it is. Oreo cookie. Cookie filling cookie, right? Mark begins a story, he interrupts it to tell another story, and then he returns to the first story. Um, and this is a way that moves the narrative along, but it also means that you've got two stories who are uh, that are informing one another. Here we have Jairus's daughter, the woman with the hemorrhage, and Jairus's daughter. And once you 
know this pattern, you'll see it lots of times in Mark's gospel. You can watch for it. Now, the filling is luscious in, these, in this particular cookie, but I'm going to focus on the cookies. But I, wanna, um, I wanna, want you to notice several things about the, the filling of verses 25 to 34. Jesus interrupts a mercy to do a mercy. The interruption becomes the schedule. Now, that's a really important point. We could really spend the rest of our time talking about that. This is one of four healing miracles that Jesus does for women in Mark's gospel or for females. And in each, he breaks down a social barrier of some sort. In this particular intercalation, two females are restored to life-giving capacity. In verses 25 to 34, it's very interesting. The woman takes the initiative and then she comes forward to admit what it is that she's done when she could fade away in the crowd. I thought, this is a woman I want in the boat with me in a storm, right? But the miracle, I think, is to highlight Jesus' authority over the human body and his superhuman knowledge. Who touched my garment could mean that Jesus is angry by being defiled by a menstruating woman, but it doesn't mean that. In fact, the story is considered so indelicate that some of the church's lectionaries leave it out. I remember teaching this section in Mark to some undergraduates, and one of the young men in the first row was quite horrified when I used the term gynecological, to which one of the women piped up and said, what did you think, she had a nosebleed? Jesus commends this woman's faith. And that, of course, was the theme of the story we heard last week. Have you, are, why are you afraid? Don't you have any, any faith? He heals her longstanding problem, and thereby he restores her to her community from which she may have been excluded for 12 years. Now, that bit is the filling, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, we can talk about it in our small groups if you like. Back to the cookies. <laughs> The disciples of Jesus appear in this story as mute watchers and not major players in the action. After Jesus himself, the major characters are the father, the crowd, as it often is in Mark, and the little girl. And Jesus has a word to each of these that will be generalized and embroidered on through the rest of his public ministry and through what we call um, ordinary time in the lectionary. So here's the word to the Father. Do not fear. Again, this is a link to, to the gospel text we heard last Sunday. Jairus, the father, is depicted as the leader of the synagogue, a, a good person, an important person. And so it's a startling gesture of supplication when this important synagogue leader falls at the feet of Jesus and appeals not for himself, but for his little daughter, for whom he cares deeply so much for um, people who think that Judaism doesn't care about women. This is, this is a text that shows the opposite is absolutely true. And Jesus immediately responds to this man and to his predicament and sets off, off with him. And the healing of the woman slows their progress. I often stop to think about how Jairus must have felt when Jesus stopped en route to help his daughter to, to help somebody else. People come from Jairus's house and, and give him the worst news. It's too late. Your daughter's died. Don't bother Jesus any longer. And Jesus says to him, don't fear, only believe. A negative imperative and a positive one. Don't fear is the characteristic command of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, in the whole Bible, don't fear is the characteristic word of heaven to earth. But um, beware when an angel shows up and says it, life is probably about to um, get very complex for some human being. 
Jesus did not come to issue words of judgment, but comfort and consolation. In Mark's gospel, as they did in the story we heard last week, the associates of Jesus have two options. They can fear or they can have faith. Watch for it in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, the opposite of faith is not unbelief, but fear. So the second word Jesus gives is to the crowd. The child is not dead, but sleeping. Early uh, in Mark, Jesus is often with or trying to get away from a crowd that functions in Mark's gospel like a Greek chorus. Watch the crowd in Mark because they are always commenting on the progress of the action. At Jairus's house, when they get there, the crowd um, is swollen by the professional mourners who have already arrived. Now, the problem with crowds is that they don't think very clearly. People do things in crowds that they would never do alone. From the Caesars to the Hitlers to some American politicos, people can be incited to do things in a mob they would never do on their own. I don't need to give us examples of this. In Mark's gospel, the crowds cry Hosanna and then they cry crucify. And here at Jairus's house, the emotional intensity of the crowd has taken over. They are entirely mistaken about the reality, which is that the child is not dead, but sleeping. And the word that Mark uses, uh, katagalao, literally means that the crowd laughed Jesus down. Jesus' word to them is essentially, be careful things are not always what they seem. Child is not dead but sleeping. Things are not always what they seem. And this is going to be true many times in the ministry of Jesus in Mark. Think of the Syrophoenician woman or the blind man on the Jericho Road who's the only one who really sees Jesus. Or the myrrh-bearing women uh, on the third morning after the crucifixion. In Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God is very much about the fact that things are not often as they seem. And the most dramatic example of that, of course, occurs at the end of the gospel when a dead man isn't dead. And that brings us to the third word, to the child herself, little girl, I say to you, arise. Little girl, it will echo in Mark's gospel when Jesus takes a little child and says, whomever welcomes this little child welcomes me. When he says to the crowd, let the little children come to me. Remember these, those stories? Like the crowd, the little girl here is representative of a large class of people. The cult of the child is 19th century. The world uh, in which Jesus raised up little children was a world in which children were very low on the social and family and cultural scale. Um, not only females, but the little people whom other people forget or have given up on, like the crowd has given up on this little girl, are the ones that are included in this word of Jesus. Other people may have given up on her, but Jesus hasn't. The little people will not only be in the kingdom of God, but Mark's Jesus says they will be first in the kingdom of heaven. We see here Jesus' scary promised reversal that the last will be first. These little ones, the little girl, the little people, are going to be the important people. They're going to be heaven's elite. What is Jesus' word to this particular little one? Mark retains it in Aramaic, and I've always thought that this is probably the aural, A-U-R-A-L, memory of Peter, or maybe James or John, the three disciples who are there. 
they remember that Jesus says to her, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. And when the Aramaic is translated into the Greek, the, the, the verb for arise here is exactly the same one that Mark uses for Jesus' resurrection. It's a wonderful thing that happens in the linguistic structure of the gospel. The, this present imperative, arise, is the Lord's word to all the little people. Be resurrected. These three words of Jesus summarize the teachings we're going to hear over and over again in ordinary time. First, don't fear, believe. Mark's gospel suggests that we can live as fearful people or we can believe in Jesus and his promises. Number two, not dead, but sleeping. Things are not always what they seem. In fact, they are frequently not what they seem. The dead may be merely sleeping, waiting for somebody to awaken them, waiting for some of us who are Christian to act like resurrected people. And number three, we have to learn to see these things from Jesus' point of view. He says to each one of us, little one, get up, arise, be resurrected. And when we do, we will receive, as the little girl must have received, something to eat, a very practical little word at the end of the story, um, get, get her a snack. Uh, when, we, when we receive this command to be resurrected, we will receive from his scarred hand the very ultimate something to eat. The feast that follows the heavenly banquet.